green light. Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to this video for universities. Um, if you are a student or a researcher, or if you're in the academia uh, world, um, you're in the right place. Um, if you want to discover more about the Wikio, this is the place. And today we will have a practical session. My name is Andrea Carvalho. Um, I'm a training officer at uh, Mercator Ocean International, and I'll be joined today by Ergan Fouché, an ocean engineer uh, from Novelties. Hello, Ergan. Hi, Andrea. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here today. So, yes, my name is Ergan Fouché. I work at Novelties as an ocean engineer. And so uh, here are the guidelines for uh, today's session. Um, so we're having this meeting on the Click Meeting platform. Uh, on this platform, you can ask your questions directly on the chat. Don't forget to write the question mark. Um, and then we will, after each uh, practical session, we will have a Q&A session. So uh, we will answer all your questions. We are, um, we have a Padlet, uh, which is a, a web page on which you can find all the material that we have developed. So you will be able to access uh, on this website uh, the replays for, from today's and yesterday's session. You will find all the practical material that we will present you today and also plenty of other resources. To access the Padlet, you can click on the orange button of the, on the top of the window here. It's written dedicated material. And if you click on it, uh, you will access the web page. So here's the program of today's session. So as we said, this is a practical session. We will explain you how to use uh, Wikio for your own use. First, we will have a demonstration of the Wikio viewer from uh, Jean Etienne. Then we will have a Wikio computational resources uh, presentation from Julia. And then the practical exercises. So from uh, for Jupyter.books and from QGIS from uh, Alexandre and Daria. So we can start now, I think. Uh, Jean-Étienne, uh, he's going to present us the Wikio viewer. Hi, Jean-Étienne. Thank you for being Hi, here. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hello. Hello. You can so, share the yes, Great. I think right now you are looking to it. That's great. So hello, everyone. I'm going to present you the data viewer of Wikio. Um, first of all, how to access it? Uh, once you're on the wikio.eu uh, website, you have this option here. And you just, once you are registered in, you can click on data. And this will bring you to the data viewer. So this is what you look. Uh, this is what uh, the data viewer look like uh, once you are registered in. Um, so right now I'm going to start with uh, the different button and how to how to use it. Uh, first of all, you can zoom in or zoom out using the the wheel button of your mouse. So this will be useful to to zoom in certain area of the data viewer, and you just have to to click on a certain space to and drag it just to to move on the map. On the right of the screen, you have different buttons used to that are useful for different as using different tools. So, for example, you have the locate button where you can click on the on the area and you have the location of the the coordinate of the button. You have the measure option, which is used to measure uh, a distance between two points. Then you have the set area of interest button. So this area is used. Uh, to select to select a certain area, and just to to get the coordinate of the four points of this area, and this will be useful later. And then you have the settings button. The settings will be uh, if you want to display the map with a country border, uh, if you want the coastline, and for the units. If you are more interesting in miles or nautic miles uh, lens, for, for for instance. On the left side. And you can, of course, uh, close what just uh, what you just draw by clicking on the on the cross. On the left, uh, by default, you have two data sets displayed. So here we have one data set from the Copernicus Land Services, which is the Global 10 Daily Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, and we have uh, Seawater Velocity from Copernicus Marine, 
which come from the uh, Global Analysis Forecast uh, 124. Uh, so here we can see uh, what it looked like on the map over the European uh, area, continent. Um, first of all, uh, we will have, uh, I'm going to explain you all the different buttons we can find uh, on these two uh, data sets. So the eye here is used to display or to um, hide the data set. So if I click on it, I will, hide, I will see the basic map and it's the same for the for the seawater here. I will see the uh, default map for for ocean. It's really useful when you have, for, exa for example, uh, two data sets from uh, Copernicus Marine, for instance. So will you have uh, several data about the sea uh, mixed, and so you can use them for displaying only one. Uh, here I have uh, two data sets from uh, I have one data set from land and one data set for marine. So of course they are not touching other, so I can display both of them without any issue. Um, on the uh, under the, the title, you will have the the color uh, grid, which is used to to display the the data value over the color. Uh, for this, actually, you can uh, you can see this uh, this little log button here, which uh, the Copernicus uh, land doesn't have for this data set. Uh, just to display the the color as a, on a log scale, so you will see a difference. Uh, it's it's depend on your preference. Uh, to take the, the button from the left to the right, uh, the first button you have is to subset and download the, the data. So by clicking on it, it will load the layer data and you will have off the field uh, to fill in order to, to download and to request the, the data. We'll see it later. The second button is the information button. By clicking on it, you will have access to, the, to all the, data, the details uh, about the data set um, information. So first of all, you have this, the, the complete title, you have the abstract and all the classification, origin, provider, and the different resources uh, in JSON uh, metadata or XML. Also, you have some point of contact. And on the left, you will have the temporal extent. So from when to where uh, as the date and the lat and long extent. So you can click on the cross to to remove this uh, this uh, this window. Uh, the layer opacity button is used to uh, to change the layer as if you want to to have it more away, uh, more or less uh, displayed on the map. So it's just uh, just it. And uh, the data set uh, layer button, this button here, is just to show all the different uh, variables we have inside the same data set. So here, for example, I have the seawater velocity. But in the same data set I saw from the global analysis uh, 124, which one the seawater velocity come from. If we click on it, we'll see different all the other different variables we can have access. So for example, here I have the seawater velocity coming from the daily mean field from global ocean physics analysis and forecast update daily. But I can see any other, for example, the instantaneous field for product global analysis forecast. And if I click on it, I have also some seawater velocity, but with different data because it's from the instantaneous. So if I click on it, it will change. And I log it here, but I can display it. So let's go back on the first one. Just to show you, so I sh already showed you the, the log scale to show you the, well, the log scale. And this one, this button is for the vector. It will show the, the vector direction of the current. Uh, and by zooming in, uh, you will see more and more uh, vector as it uh, at the definition grew up. So by zooming in, you will see very well the as, a, as on the scale, we see there is more uh, seawater velocity, but we can see too the, the direction of the seawater. Uh, you can click on the cross on the top right of each layer uh, to delete them from the from the map. So if I zoom out, I click on the on the cross, it will display just like we just like I did before with the eyes. But uh, all the information, uh, I mean, uh, it will completely uh, dis disappear from my uh, from my from my layer. If I want to add or to look at a, at a specific data set, I can click on the plus button uh, from my layer tab, and it will open me the catalog. Uh, on the right of the catalog, you have the complete list of all our 3, uh, 300, sorry, uh, 47 uh, data sets. Uh, but 
instead of scrolling until you find the good one, uh, on the left, you have a um, filter in order to find the, the one you want. So you have a free text search area where you can search uh, the keywords of what you want. But uh, you can also uh, sort them by, uh, by, by specific uh, variables. So for example, if I'm looking for a, a specific uh, data set, which is the, the high resolution of phenology uh, from Copernicus land, I'm going to select Copernicus land. I know it's only uh, above the Europe continent. And here I have all the tags uh, related to Copernicus land and Europe. And if I look at it, I can see that I have the phenology. So by clicking on it, I will see that I have only five data sets. And for me, I want the, for example, for instance, uh, the yearly production, LEA projection. So if I click on details, I will have the all details uh, with the abstract, the, the source, the resource, and the contact, uh, just like when I clicked on the information button uh, on the layer. So yes, this is the one I want, and I'm going to click Add to Map. By clicking Add to Map, I can see all the different variables that I have on this data set. And for me, I want the total production for the season one. So I'm going to scroll, and on the bottom, I can see the total productivity season one. So let's Add to Map. After that, I just scroll up and click on the Close button. So I'm going to load the, the subset and metadata. So here over my area, I'll select using the set area of interest, uh, a certain area, let's say over, over France. So the different area I need to fill in order to download data for this uh, specific uh, variable, I will so select a bonding box because I want data only from this bonding box. If I fill nothing, I will have all the data set, uh, all the data available for all the area. But as I want only a few uh, few data, I will select the, this data set. I can copy from the map, or I can directly enter the, the coordinate if I want. And I'm going to, I'm going to select only uh, the tw uh, 2019 uh, year. So I can click on the bottom. You have the timeline. It's um, it's uh, the timeline where you have on uh, on a gray uh, on, a, on the gray bar, white bar. You have the all the area, the temporal extent actually. So I can see it's only from 2017 to 2021. Uh, so I'm going to click uh, beginning of 2019, copy from year because this is one year only. So it doesn't uh, it doesn't care why I click uh, uh, on the year. At least uh, it's in 20, uh, 2019, so an early 2020. Copy from year. It's the first January because it is a a data, a data set for only one year. Uh, all the other information are not, are not mandatory. When you have um, a parameter that is mandatory, you will have a little red cross uh, showing it. So once I'm done here, I just can request my data. And here it's done. So request and successfully, and I can monitor it. By monitoring, it will send me to the jobs tab. So here uh, I have my current uh, my current request, which is completed by now. Uh, and I can display it. Uh, I have the date and the hour I made the request uh, in, in the bottom of the of the title. So by clicking on the folder icon, uh, it will show me all the results uh, I've got. So I see I have a 69 results for the, for the area I requested. And I just can order any files. So for example, the first one, I just click on order and it will ask for the server for this specific file. So I have to wait a little bit. And once it's ready, this uh, download icon will appear. And just by clicking on it, I will be able to download a uh, mighty file. So here it is. Um, we can see 69 results is quite big. So in order to, to not uh, click on each uh, 69 order button and click on uh, download button, I have the uh, API request already ready. So this left button here is uh, will me show you, will show me sorry the um, the API request, and by clicking on it, I will see the API request. Uh, this request is used uh, on the Harmonize Data Access uh, API. Uh, the Harmonize Data Access uh, is what uh, is used is the same for any of the Copernicus services, um, and it's what's it's what the, the data the data viewer used to request and give you the data. 
So here you can just copy the data. If you want, you have the button here. So you just copy it, close it, and you can use it on uh, any of Python script uh, using uh, the Python uh, client um, HDIP or on Jupyter Hub, etc. as you will see uh, uh, later on this, uh, this day. And just if you come back to the layer, uh, just sorry, you click again on the folder to show them, uh, to, to hide them again. Uh, you will have the full historic of all your jobs done the last seven days. After seven days, the jobs are automatically deleted. And we can see here, uh, I have all, I have always the title as the title. I have always um, the name of the, the variable of the data set. But here, I have the data set ID directly. It's because I use actually the, an API request uh, using uh, inside a, a notebook script. So this is why uh, the data viewer show me he knows I used the HD API to request data, but I didn't use the data viewer. So uh, I have only this uh, this uh, this information, but can I still have access to the data I requested. And if I go on the layer again, uh, here, so I'm going to copy again the, the area, again from the same date. So let's say this time uh, to 2021. And here uh, I can directly copy the the API request. The API request is automatically generated as I change the, the variable. So here I can see I have 2021 as I just did. Uh, so you can use the data viewer to uh, see all the variables you are needed to, to request uh, to request data. You copy it and then you, you can go on your script to to download to request and download the data and not use the, the and not wait on the on the job table. Um, just a quick more information uh, here on the right side, you have uh, done right side, you have the button to show you the, the help center and uh, to have access to the help support of Wikio directly. So here you have the, the article as presented by Cedric yesterday and you have uh, and here you have the message where you can contact us and you can click on this little icon too, which will do exactly the same. So here is it for the presentation of the Wikio data viewer. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, John Etienne. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's really uh, interesting to see uh, how we can access uh, the data and uh, display it. Um, and I think we have a few questions uh, for you, if you're happy to answer them. Yes. <laughs> Uh, great. So I'll just so first one. Can a shape file be uploaded as area of interest? Uh, right now on the Wiki of Data Viewer, only uh, area of interest uh, of a rectangle, uh, at least on uh, only four points, uh, is available. We we can't uh, draw polygon, for for instance, as um, as an area of interest. Okay. But then no shape file, is it? So yes, so no shape file. Oh, so yes, okay, great. Um, second one. In data viewer, is it possible to navigate to a precise location by entering its coordinates? I think you've mentioned that. Right? Um, we have that. we have the tool button, uh, the the point button to click on a certain point and have its coordinates, but we can't mm. uh, we can't see the specific coordinate when when we enter it on the bonding box area uh, on the parameter on the on the left. So we we don't have a, a specific field where we can enter uh, uh, enter coordinate and see it on the on the map uh, itself. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Okay. Um, and next one. Uh, do, 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 do. Next one, I think it's this one. Just to clarify, both the TIFF and the numerical data, like NetCDF, can be requested requested in this way. Yes, uh, as the harmonious data uh, is harmonized, uh, we can uh, we can uh, get all the. Um, all the data of, uh, provided by the different Copernicus services. So we have uh, tfile, nncdf, .zip, uh, and all the other files we can find again on the Copernicus Marine Services, Copernicus Land Services, uh, and so on. OK. Great. And that one, wow, now we have quite a few questions. That's good. <laughs> Keep going. Um, I guess the API request syntax language is described in some section of the help documentation. Yes, 
could you kindly share the link? <laughs> yes, uh, we we will share the link either on the chat or we can also make it available um, in our uh, Padlet. Uh, as Ergan mentioned late, um, earlier, there's a dedicated place where you can find all the materials of these workshops and we can um, put all these links as well for the user support articles over there. So um, you will see they are really clear and direct to the point. So it will be really useful. Um, and I think uh, another one. Does the TIF file have its coordinates embedded? Can it this be displayed in QGIS? Uh, I'm not sure, but normally yes. It's to be confirmed, but uh, but normally it's uh, if you can. Uh, if the coordinates are embedded uh, when you download the T file from the Copernicus land service, so yes, on Wikio mm -hmm. it will be available. Okay, great. And I think I skipped one. Uh, mm -mm. How is Wikio different from EU browser? If and this, for this yeah, I, I don't know I if it is. Answer this question, sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's maybe more general, right? Um, da, 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 da. Okay, what kind of copyright the data has? Uh, is there a link where is it possible to check the allowed users? uses? Uh, all the copyright for all the different files and the person to sit uh, for the citation on the about uh, information of each data set. So when you click on the little uh, information button, you will have, uh, if you uh, scroll down, you will have the information about the copyright, the, the people to all cite those. in an article or, or et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... It's just another one. Uh, if we put the account password and username in the API request, uh, where? On the, um, on the help document, on the help center, you will have uh, articles uh, explaining how to use uh, the API request. Uh, you can use curl, for, for instance, and but you need a token. And for this token, you have to, to provide indeed your, uh, your Wikio uh, username and password, or you can use the Python, uh, the Python client uh, which embed everything, and you just provide your uh, your Wikio credential, and you go, you're free to go to to use uh, mm -hmm. the API request. Okay, um, and I think uh, we have answered all the questions um, dedicated to you, at least. <laughs> um, Great, we can you. try to answer all the other questions um, later on in the session, on um, also the ones that we haven't answered. We will make sure we will leave the answers in a in the Padlet as well. Um, thank you, Jenny Tien. <laughs> You're welcome. And, uh, Have a good day. Yeah. Good you presentation. Too. Thank mm -hmm. you. And now we will uh, give the floor to Julia, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So we'll search for Julia. And oh yeah, perfect. <laughs> Um, so Julia will tell us more about um, uh, the computing uh, powered computer resources on Wikio. Um, Julia Wagman, the floor is yours whenever you want. <laughs> okay, excellent. Thank you. And also good morning from my side. My name is Julia Wagemann and some of the questions you had about how to, for example, use your username and password in the API, I will actually go on now and show you how you can request data from the Wikio platform um, and use Python notebooks to then also open and analyze the data. So I'll share my screen and I hope you all see my uh, browser. And uh, so basically this is the interface also showing Tien show. This is the Wikio landing page. Uh, uh, so if you are not registered, then I, uh, I ask you to register because you need to have an account in order to uh, request data and work with the data. But once you are registered, you can go to sign in and then sign in with your username and password. I also do the same here. Um, and once you're signed in, um, you come back to the same interface, uh, but instead of sign in, you can you have you see here the the sign out button, and you see here a link to a dashboard. And uh, there, I ask you to go there, and in the dashboard, you get your profile information about your account. 
but this dashboard also allows you to give access or to provide you access to a Jupyter Hub, which is available um, on uh, for, for Wikio. And so if you go to this Jupyter Hub, um, it, it will take a while to, um, to start. But once the Jupyter Hub started, you will probably see a slightly different interface than mine. But you certainly will find a folder which is called uh, public. And uh, this is uh, this is basically all the uh, Wikio, uh, all the Jupyter Notebook resources that are available for Wikio data. So um, different examples from different application areas, how you can use Wikio for climate, for atmospheric composition applications, for land applications or for marine, um, you can find in this public folder. And I also want to just uh, tell you that uh, if for today, because we focus on atmospheric composition applications and specifically how you can use uh, Wikio and the data that is available on Wikio for fire applications, if you go to Wikio for atmosphere folder and then again to atmosphere and then the folder uh, 20, 2010 Wikio training, you will find a set of notebooks and these are the notebooks I go through uh, with you now. And I will introduce you to three different data sets you have access to from Wikio. And in the form of a Jupyter notebook, I will show you how you can access the data, how you can open the data. So you also see in what file format the respective data set is disseminated and how you can visualize the data for a specific fire event that uh, occurred in 2021 over Siberia. So um, just because um, this is also important to know, under the public folder, it's only you only have read access because uh, this is basically available for, for everyone. But, um, and for this reason, I um, duplicated the content here in my interface. And this is basically a copy of the notebooks you will find under the public Wikio for Atmosphere folder. You will find um, here, uh, I, I just copied the notebook in my, in my working environment here. So as I said, I want to introduce you to three different data sets. Um, and so two satellite uh, data uh, from, from the Copernicus program, and then one model-based reanalysis pro product from the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service. Uh, for each data set, you will see two notebooks. Um, so um, the first notebook is always um, shows you how to how you can access the data um, with the HDA API client. Um, and then the second notebook shows you uh, example where we load the data, where we uh, inspect the data, how it is organized and where we also visualize um, the data. So I start with um, an example of the Sentinel-5P data um, and specifically the level two data product for carbon monoxide, because carbon monoxide is a good trace gas um, which can be used to, for uh, during, during fire um, events to, um, to see the um, elevated levels of carbon monoxide um, are usually um, a, 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 a good tracer for um, indicating about the strength and severity of fires. So uh, if I open the notebook uh, number 10, uh, which says Sentinel 5P level two carbon monoxide retrieve, um, I basically, I um, add, um, you will get guided in a step-by-step -step step, step -step way to um, retrieve the data. So um, each notebook, uh, if you're not very familiar with Python, uh, but uh, in the end, at the beginning, we always have to import specific libraries. And for this, uh, for, for retrieving the data, because we also work with um, data descriptor files, which I will show you in a while, um, we will need the Python library JSON in order to be able to read a JSON file, which you see here. And then uh, the first step, if, um, if not available, and it was already just updated yesterday, so I just um, show you um, the Python package we make use of. So it is a Python package called Wikio HDA API client, and this allows you to request 
uh, data uh, from the from Wikiu with the uh, with, with the help of um, Python. And so, if you if it's not installed, then you can just run uh, this uh, this command, and then basically it uh, is uh, just installed. If it's already satisfied, then um, it is uh, um, it, it will tell you. Um, and if it is uh, installed, then you also might need to restart your kernel because then with a restarted kernel, you can also access um, the, the Python package or the updated Python package. So I restart here my kernel just to showcase you uh, the example. Um, so then I run here again the first um, import and then I can now import also the updated HDA package. And then basically um, we have already our uh, package that helps us to request the data. But before we request the data, we also have to first find the data. And I think Sean Tien gave you already a very detailed um, example on how you can uh, view data, how you can load data um, in specific data layers. Um, I, um, I will not go um, to this um, a lot in details because you also see here images. Basically, you can open the catalog and then you have a search interface. We are here specifically interested in Sentinel 5P. So you can, for example, enter in the free text search Sentinel 5P and you will get um, the data layer for Sentinel 5P Tropomi. And then um, if you then uh, load it, the um, loaded the data set, you can then specify um, the information you, you're interested in. So as um, Shoi Tien showed you, you can specify an area of interest on the map, or if you have coordinates, you can also enter directly your coordinates um, in this bounding box information here. Uh, then the sensing start and stop time, the processing level, as I said at a moment, so for, for this example, we specifically, I will introduce you to the Sentinel 5P level two product. And for level two, you see then here the different product type options for Sentinel 5P. And for level two, there are different types or different uh, parameters available, but specifically here, we would select uh, level two for carbon monoxide. You then have to also agree to the terms and conditions. And on the, on the interface, you can either directly request the data, which then um, uh, leads you here to um, under jobs to an overview of the jobs. And once it is ready, you can download the data. Or um, you can, as we want to do, you can request the data in a programmatic way. And if you go to show API request, you see here now a API request um, based on the selection you did in your interface um, here. And if you copy this API request, you can either directly copy it into your Jupyter Notebook or um, as, um, as we uh, did it here or as I prepared it, you can also copy it in a, into a JSON file. And so if I open here this JSON file, uh, with the editor, you see basically it has the, the a similar information, like not exactly the information we have here in the image, but we have here the data set ID, the bounding box information, then the date range um, for when we want to have the data, and then um, additional information to, to make the data selection more precise. So specifically the product type we're interested in, um, the processing level and also the timeliness of the of the satellite data. So um, okay, so basically we are now in um, on the status that we selected our data for the specific day we are interested in. So as I said, the example is focusing on the Siberian fire, wildfires in in summer 2021. So in August there were severe fires happening in Siberia in 2021. And for this reason, I uh, hear my the, the, the API request selects or would like to select data from the 12th of August 2021 over an area in Siberia. So we have this in a, in a JSON data descriptor file. The next step is to configure uh, the Wikio API authentication. So this means, as I said at the beginning, if you're not registered here, you have again the link to 
uh, to register yourself to Wikio. And once you are registered, you will have a username and a password. And so this is um, one, uh, one way how you can uh, uh, authenticate yourself with the HDA API client um, uh, in a in a ad hoc way if you work more um, and more regularly with Wikio, it also probably makes sense to store these information not directly in the notebook but but in a specific um, authentication um, uh, uh, text file which you can uh, store on your on your home working directory and then anytime you load the HDI Python package, um, it automatically already loads also your username and password. But for today, just to also show you how you can uh, get started quite uh, quickly, um, you can basically, you can set your authentication details directly with this command. So we use the Python package HDA and here the constructor client. So basically we construct here a, a client class and in our client class, we want to set the configurations. So the URL is uh, to Wikio broker, to the data broker. And then here the hashes you have to replace with your specific username and password. So once you um, done this, you can then execute the cell and then you have your client initiated. And with this client, you can then um, go and uh, request the data. So uh, the next step is then, so we have now our data selected. We have our, um, our client authenticated. Uh, the next step is then to load the data descriptor file, which, um, which you can do with the Python package JSON. So we imported the package at the beginning. You load it with JSON load, and then you see it uh, here that basically the same information that is in the JSON file, you can also see here now in, the, in this uh, data variable. And then the next step is basically you can simply, um, so the next step is basically it first um, looks if for our specific um, uh, details we, we provided for the data, so for the specific day, for this area, and also for the time range, uh, the da data is available. And if, there is, uh, if, if data is available, then it will give us first here uh, just a, uh, a, a printout of how many data have been found and have been matched. And so here you see for this specific uh, example, two data sets have been found. And if we are okay with two data sets, then the next step is that you download the data. I, because I um, didn't, I don't authenticate myself yet, uh, but um, it, you, you, can, you can try it out. It uh, should work. And I already downloaded, downloaded these two data sets and um, you, I put them into the data folder here. So basically what you will get is a zip archive of Sentinel 5P offline level two carbon monoxide data. So we see here also the date from the 12th of August. Um, both are from 12th of August, just for different times. Uh, one at around 3 a.m. and the other one at 5 a.m. in the morning. Important, once you request the data, they are disseminated in, in, in a zip archive. Okay, so uh, now we downloaded the data. We have two data sets available. Let's have a look um, how the how Sentinel 5P carbon monoxide data can be used to track and trace fires. So for this, we open the notebook 11, um, which just uh, is about to highlight and shows you how the data is organized um, and how you can uh, visualize it. So the first part is again to, to, to import required uh, libraries. So um, we make, because the data is often, uh, is, is this, the, the data format itself is in NetCDF. Um, and so, but first we have to extract it from the zip archive, but we make use if possible of the XRA data library or Python library. And then we also have zip file in order to um, unzip the data archive. And we also use matplotlib and cardopy to, um, to request the data, uh, to, to visualize the data. There is also 
a um, you will see a notebook with some helper functions um, and this is a, a different set of helper functions just to help you to um, especially specifically if you're not very um, experienced with Python um, it's easy because you can just apply this helper function with a set of keyword arguments um, if you're a bit more um, literate with Python then feel free to have a look into this functions folder or also use your own uh, functions to to plot the data so but these functions they help you just to um, to specific to particularly handle the data so for example to generate a geographical subset uh, or to visualize um, data with uh, with the combination of matplotlib and cartopy and um, so you can run an external notebook with the command um, run and then um, all the functions that are available in this notebook can also be loaded um, in, the, um, in, in, in another notebook. So basically we can uh, do this um, here. Okay, uh, sorry. So uh, probably I have to load the, the, um, the, the other, the other um, libraries um, first. But if you load it, uh, then basically you can uh, you can also run these functions and make make use of the functions. So the first step is to unzip the um, the data arc, the data file. And so um, it, as I said, I put them under data. They come with a very cryptic and very long name. So feel free also to rename um, the data folder. So you can also call it S5P. Um, and then the specific time when it was sensed. Um, I didn't rename it. So um, basically here, uh, you just, as I just say, okay, please unzip the data. And once it is unzipped, I did it only for one archive for the one um, sensed at 3 a.m. in the morning. If we have a look into the data here, you will have two different data files, um, one NetCDF file and one um, data file with additional metadata on uh, with the CDL um, ending, but we are interested in the NetCDF um, file. And so the next step is to load the data, the NetCDF data file, um, but, but which, we, which we do with X-Array and the function open underscore data set. Here again, it is very cryptic. So we first say go to the data folder, then to the Sentinel-5P data folder, and then open the NetCDF file. Important for Sentinel-5P data is uh, to specify that we are interested in the data that are in the product group. So if we don't specify here group, then um, we only get a set of um, descriptive metadata, but not the real um, the, uh, X-Array data set. And so here um, for Sentinel-5P data, you have to specify that the data we're interested in are in, under the product group. And once you do it, then um, we open a X array data set, which is a data, which is a collection of different data variables and parameters. And so you see here like the coordinates, the dimensions of the file and the data variables. And you see here that we have a, a set of different data variables um, like um, and the one we are interested in is carbon monoxide total column. So this means from an X-Array data set, uh, if we want to load the actual data values, which are stored as a data array, we have to load this variable um, first. So uh, the next step is then basically to load um, our X-Array data array, which has the, the relevant data information we are in, in, interested in. And you can do this from our X-Array data array, which we call Sentinel-5P. We have square brackets and we add here the name of the variable we're interested in. And then if we go back, so here it was indicated that we want to have a X-Array data set. But then if we load the data variable, we then have a X-Array data array. And again, with the dimensions, uh, like one time step, scan line, and round pixels. And then additionally, some metadata information that are helpful also to vis for vis visualizing, for example, the data. Or what, you, what we also see here, um, that uh, we, so per, uh, 
per default, the units are uh, follow SE standards. And so Sentinel 5P is disseminated in uh, molecules per square meters. And, uh, but the data also offers a multiplication factor um, in order to convert the data to molecules per square centimeters, which is of a unit that is more, uh, of, more often applied um, in, 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 the, in the general um, scientific research and also with uh, uh, using, um, using carbon monoxide uh, total column data. And so we can basically use, make use of um, uh, these uh, like some information just to get to know some more information to see, okay, what are the latitude and longitude information um, here? And then uh, here, because we have a just one time step, uh, which basically, um, yeah, also helps us if we just get rid of this additional dimension. And this is uh, what we do here. So we just uh, select one specific, this time step, uh, what our data um, has, and then we have only um, our scan line and gone pixel information. Then we can apply, then we can apply the multi multiplication factor in order to convert the data to um, molecules per square centimeters. We also use the attribute long name, which is vertically integrated carbon monoxide column. We create, and then we can create a geographical subset to have a subset for um, for, for the specific um, uh, region over Siberia. We already identified this subset, but like Sentinel 5P data, they come in the full um, uh, swath length, uh, length. And so with this uh, geographical subset, subsetting, we subset the data for our specific region of interest. And the next step is then we convert the data. So we apply the conversion factor um, and then we can visualize the data with uh, the function visualize p color mesh. Um, and this uh, is a combination of, it makes use of matplotlib and cartopy and a set of keywords helps us to specify the plot. So we say here, we want to have our, um, our, our data array with carbon monoxide converted. Um, we also apply a conversion factor here just to make it easier to read the carbon monoxide values. Then longitude and latitude, we use here um, units uh, because we converted it to molecules per square centimeters. We use the, the long name as tidal and we can also uh, set here the specific geographical bounding box. And uh, here basically you see around 130 degrees uh, east um, on 12th of August 2021 and around between 60 and 70 degrees north, um, we had um, high um, fire activity, um, um, unfortunately, um, in, this, in this summer. And so you can send a 5P carbon monoxide, uh, total, common, total column carbon monoxide data is a good uh, tracer to, to track and monitor uh, intense fire, wildfire um, activity and events. So the next uh, data uh, I would like to show you and that can be used also for fire um, uh, fire monitoring is Sentinel-3 uh, uh, from the Sentinel-3 satellite and specifically from the OLCHI instrument and uh, this data is a level one uh, product um, which can be, if we use the red, green, and blue composite, like an RGB composite, either for true color or false color, can also be um, a good product and uh, data uh, in order to, to see specific fire activity. And so the next uh, data I will show you will specifically um, I, or, identify, or identify or, or show the fire activity here in this in this area, and uh, I will probably just um, say here again: the first notebook is again that showcases you how you can retrieve um, Sentinel three Olchi level one B data from the Wikio client. Here again, it is the same step. So you have to make sure that the latest version of HDA is um, installed. Then you have to import it. 
um, again, you go to Vikio and you select the data. Um, you here again, you can have a look to the old sheet data descriptor file. I can open it and uh, showcase you that here we also selected again the bounding box over Siberia. We have also the 12th of August 2021, and uh, we specifically um, want to select only one specific um, file um, around 3 a.m. in the morning. You can also play around because if you do um, a, a wider temporal window, then you will just get more results um, that, that are downloaded. Um, and so in our case, um, I just wanted to download um, one file. And so that's why I made the temporal window very, um, very, very narrow. Um, and so the data here, if you download the data from this notebook, um, it will also come in a zip archive. So um, you will see here, it will come um, with the ending dot um, send three, but you have to change this to a zip archive and then you can use the Python package uh, zip file to unzip this, uh, this archive as well. And once it is unzipped, then you will see that it is uh, yeah, unzipped into a regular folder. And in this folder, you see a set of, uh, I think, around 18 files with um, the, for, the, for each different channel, um, a Radiance uh, NetCDF information, then the geo coordinates, um, et cetera. And in the notebook 21, I will show you now um, how you can load this data and combine all these NetCDF files in order to create a true and false color um, uh, RGB composite. So we start again with loading um, all the data, all the Python packages we need in order to, uh, uh, to, to operate and handle the data. So it's the same. It is a NetCDF file. So we make sure to have XRA, to have matplotlib, to cartobi. And here we also make use of um, the exposure function from the sky image or scikit-learn um, package. And also again, zip file um, and glob to combine um, a set of different NetCDF files at once. So here, um, if it's not um, unzipped again, so here you can use uh, this to unzip the folder. Uh, and then you, uh, the next step is to load um, the, uh, or to load all the NetCDF files that are um, in the folder, which I just showed you. Um, and uh, here we see uh, that basically we loaded now all the, all, or to get an overview of all the NetCDF files that are in the folder. So we have all our uh, channel information, then we have geo coordinate information. And um, so we have all the NetCDF files um, here um, in one variable. And then we can basically, uh, the first step is just to load one single channel to see um, how the data is structured and to also get a feeling of how we can combine all these different NetCDF files together. And so if we load one, uh, so the channel one information, for example, we use XRA open underscore data set again, and we see that uh, our, our data is two dimensional. It has um, a specific number of rows and a specific number of columns. Um, and we have here also some additional attribute information. Um, and uh, so, the, so we have now a feeling of one um, of one channel. But in the in the best case, we would like to be more flexible in using any type of channel uh, ch channel uh, combination. And with this, um, it is better to use the function open MF dataset, which opens multiple NetCDF files and brings them together into one dataset object. And we, um, we say we want to co uh, combine them by the number of columns and rows, so by coordinates, but we want to have all the um, channel information. Um, and so from, for all the channels from 1 to 21, um, we, they are now in one uh, dataset uh, together. And then in the next step, uh, we can also just use the built-in plotting functionality from XRA just to have a, a quick 
image show of one channel. So here is for channel eight, for example, um, just to have a bit of um, a bit of a feeling of um, of the data. Then um, the next step is also um, the same as we did for the for the channel information to also use the uh, to open the geo coordinates to have information on latitude and longitude. So this is what we have here. So we load this also into a X array data set and we store the data, the underlying data for latitude and longitude as specific variables as let and long variable um, um, variables. And so then the next step is to combine the three different channels um, that allow us to create a true color um, RGB image. And so for um, for Sentinel-3 OLCI data, um, there is, um, so we can combine the channel 4, 6, um, and um, so, uh, um, sorry, four, uh, 8, 6, and 4 for red, green, and blue um, to create a true color um, image. So for red, we use channel 8, for green, we use channel 6, and for blue, we use channel 4. Um, alternatively, you can also try a combination by using, instead of channel 8, uh, channel 9, and you can see how, how it uh, differs. And so we use also, again, one of the predefined functions in the functions notebook, select channels for RGB, and this basically creates a uh, composite uh, or combines different channels, and um, the function returns the three bands individually. So we then have for red, green, and blue, one specific um, band from our um, overall data, data array. And so here we just have an example of the red band. And so then the next step, we um, for each of the channels, we apply some image advanced image processing functionalities just uh, to, to be able to better highlight some specific features in the image. So we normalize it, uh, which changes the range of pixel intensity um, and can improve the contrast. And so we normalize uh, each channel and then we stack them together into one, uh, into th into one three-dimensional array with the three uh, bands, red, green, and blue. And now we could we can also plot um, the RGB image, um, and but and and we see that basically it's like still not like we could improve probably some of the some of the features and the contrast. And so the next step is to apply a histogram equalization to um, highlight specific features in the image. And uh, now we see at least some of the features here are a bit better um, readable and seeable than, than before. And so the next step is then to visualize the, the RGB image also on a, uh, on a geo-referenced grid. And the next steps here showcase, so you can apply the function visualize Sentinel-3 P color mesh, um, indicating the, um, this, the um, the latitude and longitude, then our uh, information with the three bands. Um, and also here from the red channel, we use just the, um, the size of the image, like number of columns and number of rows in order to bring the data onto a SHU referenced uh, image. And so if you remember from the Sentinel-5P data, we specifically highlighted here fires in around 130. Um, and so here, basically, we have now we are around 105 degrees east um, and between 60 and 62 or 64 degrees north, we see here um, some fire activity. So I will just um, skip the next step and not going it too much into detail um, because I also want to showcase you one other data set. But there's also like specifically for fire activities, um, I think with Sentinel-3, you can also use a different combination of bands in order to create a false color composite. And the false color composite basically showcases um, healthy earth in red, uh, but also allows to specifically show smoke and fire activities um, a bit more uh, present. And so the combination you can use for a false color composite, composite specifically to highlight fires is um, for red number 17, for 
uh, green number five and for blue number two. And so this, um, and then I applied the same um, steps again, but uh, basically we just say, see the same image, but as a false color um, image. And we see here uh, quite intense um, smoke and fire activity um, again um, in, this, in this region. So this is the second uh, data um, I wanted to uh, show you, which you can use and retrieve from Wikio for fire monitoring. And um, another data set, which um, is uh, not a satellite uh, product, but a model-based uh, product from the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service is the um, CAMS reanalysis uh, data set. Again, here we have two notebooks. So one notebook is, uh, the first notebook is to um, select the data. Um, here again, I go don't go much into detail. I just open the data descriptor file. And uh, here again, we looked for the 12th of August, 2021. Um, not, we didn't select the bounding box because we, uh, the CAMS reanalysis data are global. And uh, you will see in a, minute, uh, in a minute why it makes sense also to have a global perspective. And we just specified um, the variable for uh, fire monitoring, which, uh, uh, which uh, for example, organic matter aerosol optical depth at 550 nanometers can be used and specific time steps. So the reanalysis data comes um, every three hours and for one day, for the 12th of August 2021, we selected all, all the available hours and the data also comes in NetCDF. So if we open then the notebook 3.1, um, so, uh, as I said, uh, the, the CAMS uh, reanalysis data set um, has a, a wide variety of different variables available, but as a trace gas for smoke and fires, um, you, can, or you can use organic matter aerosol optical depth. Alternatively, you can also use from the reanalysis data set total aerosol optical depth or total column carbon monoxide to monitor fires. Um, again, we have the same, uh, so uh, just when we download the data, I go to again to my data folder, it will come with a cryptic name. So the NetCDF file is directly downloaded. It, come, it will come with a cryptic name. I renamed the data set to uh, comes EAC underscore data um, NetCDF. So feel free to also do the same or use the name um, that is provided by um, uh, by the by the download or through the download. So I would need to change here, go to the data folder. And um, so basically, um, so because it's like model-based data in NetCDF, it is a very structured, regular, um, gridded data. So we have longitude and latitude, and we have eight time steps um, for because we requested um, every three hours um, uh, data. And we have one data variable, like the organic matter aerosol optical depth. Um, so we can basically just inspect now the coordinates of the file more in detail. So first to see the times. So we see here every three hours. Then we see latitude um, and longitude. And here, this is something um, specific for model-based data. Um, they are not automatically on a grid from minus 180 to 180, so, but they're going from zero to 360. Um, it's, it's not, in, in this way, it's not a problem because um, the, 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 the visualization function can also uh, takes care of this. Um, but in case you sometimes run into problems, then you just have to remember that if you work with model-based data, most of them, they are going from zero to 360 and you have to shift the coordinates or to a minus 180 to 180 degrees uh, coordinate system. And then, um, so this is another um, option how you can retrieve a data variable. So you can either use the name of the data variable in square brackets, or you can use the data set. You have, you use a period and then the name of the data variable, and then you can load the data array. 
And we see here, like once we load the data array, we have additional attributes like units. Um, we have here um, in general aerosol optical depth um, data is uh, the, has a has a unit less um, is unit less, and we have a long name which we can also use um, for our plotting. We store them as variables, and the same we also do for the coordinates, latitude, and longitude. And then the last step is again, we apply the function visualize p color mesh um, in order to visualize the um, CAMS reanalysis organic matter aerosol optical depth product for the 12th of August 2021. And you can here play around also with different time steps. So here we showcase um, the, uh, the data at 9 a.m. UTC but uh, you can also play around with different steps. And we see here over, over Siberia, um, um, high, high elevated values of um, organic matter aerosol optical depth. And uh, yeah, with this, um, I would uh, close my data presentation um, and um, I'm open for any questions, but for now I hand over back to to the meet, uh, webinar organizers. Thank you. Oops. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Julia, for your presentation. And uh, we're very clear, we've had plenty of compliment for you. Um, and we also have some, well, many questions. Um, shall we start? <laughs> Um, so, uh, the Jupyter Hub is by definition a group tool. Can we share the netbooks related to the WKO with colleagues that do not have an account? If so, um, no? Yes, actually, so like that you don't, so the notebooks, I will paste, some, or maybe I, I give you the link, but they are also available on, Git, uh, on GitHub. Um, and all the notebooks that you see on, um, on, on the public folder, you also find on GitHub, which you can also clone uh, directly. I don't know, do you see it? If I post it directly in the chat, then you will see here the link to the GitHub Wikio uh, repository. And under there, you, for each of the application areas, you, have, you find specifically the notebooks that you also find in the public folder. Okay, uh, you can yeah, you can put the link in the in the chat probably. Um, I can see there's a question about the recording of this lecture. Um, this is not for you, Julia, but uh, as a reminder, on the Padlet you will have uh, all the replays from uh, two days and yesterday's session. Um, another question for Julia: Can we use Google Collab Notebooks in Wikio? If yes, how do we import them? So from Google Collab, so um, on your Jupyter Hub um, working environment here, so like probably you have it empty here, but um, you can basically, um, so yeah, you can upload. So like if you have a, the Google Collab notebook downloaded on your machine, then you can easily just drag and drop a notebook here. So for example, I can, uh, you don't see my screen, right? Sorry. Um, um, no. Yeah, you can share your screen if you want. Uh, yeah, one one moment. I just uh, go to my downloads folder, and then I can just uh, yeah. Do I have a notebook here? Yeah, no, I, I'm I don't have a notebook on my downloads folder. But basically, you can just easily um, uh, what you want to upload here, also data or something. You can just. Uh, a drag and drop to your work um, environment. Um, and then, or maybe I can just show you with one picture, which is probably easier. Let me just share my screen. Mm, that's this one. Okay, so if you're like here on the landing or your, your own home environment from Wikio, um, then uh, I just upload one JPEG library. I have one on my download folder. I just upload here, I just drag and drop, and you see that basically it is then uploaded. Um, and so you can do the same with, um, with any notebook or with additional data you have, et cetera. And this is, I think, the 
unfortunately a bit so you have to go to go google colab you have to download it and then you can drag and drop it to to wikio but it is possible okay great thank you mm. Here's, um, can we request data in quasi real time, for example, the day after an incident? Uh, yeah, yeah. So like uh, there is always a bit of um, latency um, between like when the data is disseminated and like it's different for, for each data product. Um, but like, yeah, usually as soon as they are disseminated, there's like some hours in between and then you can request the data also via Wikio. Thank you. Is there a written route map for the process that Mrs. Fagerman is presenting? Um, uh, I would yeah. I would need to know what is meant with a route yeah. map. Yes. <laughs> okay, so we'll ask the participant to precise. Um, Okay, so we've had uh, some questions about the link to the Jupyter Hub. So we put it in the chat here. You can, uh, if you click on the link, you will access the Jupyter Hub. Um, here's another question quite confused to me. What is group product what to write? Do you understand, Julia? Yeah, so this is um, for Sentinel 5P. So this is the way how Sentinel 5P data is structured. So inside the net CDF file, it is uh, again in, in, in a group uh, key, um, which is called product. And so that's why like all the date, the relevant information from the Sentinel 5P data file is under this group. And that's why we have to specify it um, in, in our um, X array a Python request. But you only have to say group equals and then product. And uh, basically, you have to see it like a specific folder inside the data file where we say, okay, we want to retrieve the data that is under this folder um, available. Okay, thank you. Um, notebooks are also good for machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence sorry, processing. Uh, however, the monthly subscription plan with the GPU are quite steep. Can you specify which GPUs are included in these and if there is any specifics in working with them? Um, so, like, so, so notebooks is just a tool to to do processing, right? So, um, so if the examples I showed, they they didn't need, they did, they don't use any GPU or, uh, GPUs, and uh, I think that the question is more on if the GPU is available on Wikio, correct? But I would need to hand over to someone from Wikio itself um, if GPU is available. I know also if you want to learn about machine learning and AI, um, if you go to the Jupyter Hub, you probably will get um, asked um, at the beginning of your, of your session if you want to use um, the general Earth observation uh, um, processing capabilities or machine learning. And so, and if you choose machine learning, because there has been also a massive open online course on machine learning with Earth observation for, and for Earth monitoring. It was um, last year, uh, or yeah, last year, I think. And so basically, you um, also the notebooks from this machine learning massive open online course are available on the Jupyter Hub platform on Wikio, and you can let them run and you can learn machine learning. Um, but for this, you will need um, more resources. And if you go, if you are directed, if you <coughs> access your Jupyter Hub and you are directed and you have to choose, then you have to choose the machine learning um, components because it gives you more processing power for training. I think for this, it's also important to know that like the Jupyter Hub environment I showed you, it is for, for getting a, a, a feeling for Wikio. Um, but it's like it's also limited in what you can upload and what you can also process. So you would then also need to subscribe to a plan in order to leverage the full opportunities uh, for Wikio. If I can just add uh, something for this, indeed, uh, 
on the computing uh, tab on wiki.eu, you have all the different plans you can have access um, with, uh, with or without GPU. Uh, for any plans you want to try, uh, if they don't have any GPU in them, you have access to a free trial. Uh, but as long as you need the GPU, uh, you have to subscribe uh, directly and we will get contact to you uh, to, the, to the business team. And of course, we can uh, uh, adjust any plan you need. For example, if you just need a few CPU but a lot of RAM, we can uh, make a personal plan. Of course, uh, everything is possible. Okay, thank you to you too. Um... Another additional question, um, someone is asking what are GPUs? Um, Julia or Jean-Étienne, whatever you prefer. Uh, well, it's uh, like uh, probably Jean-Étienne. Um, so it's like um, general processing unit, uh, I think. And, uh, but like specifically the, the technicalities uh, behind, um, I don't know, Shoy Tien probably or might be better to respond on this. Shoy Tien, are you still here? But otherwise, we will answer this um, later on. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. We can try to answer this one later on. Uh, we also had a specification on one, a previous question. Yeah, sorry, I, don't know. I was just muted. Um, oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, so just quickly, yes, yeah, the, the VGPU or the virtual uh, graphical processor unit, and we uh, they are specifically used for AV calculus, uh, uh, usually for machine learning or other intelligence artificial, but uh, yeah, so, so it's pretty much. Okay, um, moving on to the next question then. Are there any data in polar coordinate and how to analyze it um, and convert this polar coordinate to non-light coordinate file? Um, at, at the moment, uh, to be honest, uh, because there's like a wide range of data available on Wikio, um, I, I wouldn't exclude it, but I'm, I also don't want to say that, that it's like so the data i came across with um specifically for application uh, atmospheric composition applications um they are not specifically in polar coordinates so it's either model-based data which is very uh very regular latitude longitude or then um satellite um imagery on on specific um uh, spots and uh, specific grids which then also has to be converted to latitude longitude but uh yeah i can't give you a, a definite answer on this i'm afraid okay thank you um Another question for Jean Tien, I think, who can I contact about wrong versions installed on the virtual machine? Uh, you can contact the Wikio support, uh, either from the uh, the contact tab on the on the Wikio site or via mail at the uh, support at wikio.eu. I will write the, the address on the on the chat. Thank you very much. Um... Okay, another question about the group. Is group keyword specific for um, Sentinel-5P or also others? At least uh, the data <coughs> I came across, which is quite a few Copernicus data, it's for at the moment only for Sentinel-5P. Okay, thank you. And one last question, I think. Can we download the notebooks processing results to another cloud or PC and use existing GPUs there for further processing, if yes, how? Uh, yeah, so like on on if you're on a Jupyter Hub, then you can also easily go to any data. So if you have like a output uh, data um, from your processing or a notebook, and you can double click on with a right with the right mouse, and then there's the option to download, and then you can download a notebook or also the respective data you processed. And you can download them on your local PC and upload it somewhere else. Okay, 
Okay, thank you. I think that's it for the questions. Thank you very much, Julia, for um, this uh, great uh, presentation and for your answers to the question. Um, yes, we thank are you very much. Now, we will now have a 10 minute coffee break. Uh, and uh, after the break, we will have <laughs> Alexandre who will present us the um, uh, Jupyter notebook, and then Daria who will present us the QGIS exercises. Yes, mm -hmm, exactly. <laughs> Yes, I just wanted to make a last reminder. Um, if you haven't done it yet, you can take this time to register on Wikio so that you can later on have access to the Jupyter Lab and if you want to follow along the, the exercises. Um, but anyway, we recommend you not to, if you're a beginner, <laughs> to just uh, watch um, Alex and um, Daria. And so see you then. See you in 10 minutes.
All right. Uh, I hope you had time to do a short break, uh, get a coffee maybe, <laughs> and uh, that you're still full of energy <laughs> with our demonstrations and our exercises. As we said, today is a practical session. <laughs> um, so now we're going to introduce Alexandre Omeran, um, who's going to uh, give us a presentation and or a demonstration more specifically on a Jupyter notebook exercise. Uh, Alexandre, when you want. Yes, uh, <laughs> you can, can you hear me? Yes, yes sound perfect. clear. So hello everyone, I'm Alexandre Omrin from Novaltis. I'm also an ocean engineer. Um, so in this, in this presentation, I'm going to show you um, a notebook that was developed specially for, uh, for this training. Um, so I'm just I'm going to share my screen and uh, walk you through uh, the notebooks. So is my screen visible? I think it is. Uh, it's fine here. Yes, we see it. OK, perfect. Uh, so before starting, um, I'm going to show you the procedure to download this, the material, so the notebooks and the data files, um, because they are not available in the public folder here. So um, I think the instruction will be given on the Padlet, but I'm going to um, execute them uh, live. Um, so we're going to um, download the, a zip, the zip file containing the material of notebooks and the data uh, from the Wikio drive. So you'll have to run this command in the terminal in your home directory. OK, so <laughs> it should, it should, well, I've already created the, the data and downloaded uh, the file. So um, you should have a downloading uh, process here. But here, my file already exists, so it's not necessary. Anyway. Um, So what I'm showing this to you because um, when downloading this, you might face um, a memory space issue. So, the, so we will actually have to download um, the data in a temporary folder instead of your uh, user space um, folder. Running this command, sorry, I'm going just too fast and running uh, a command before another one. OK, so here I'm creating a temporary folder in uh, the home directory, which has um, a higher space limitation. And now I can download uh, the material. It should take no more than a few minutes. So here it's, uh, it's downloading. ET 66 seconds. So I see that there is a question about how do we have a training zip that training zip? Um, so it's available through this link here. So running this command, you'll be able to download it. That's the point of this uh, introduction.
Okay, the zip, zip is downloaded. Now we're going to unzip it, still in this temporary folder. It also takes a little while, but it's shorter than the downloading process. Now we have a lot of data, so a lot of files are shown in the terminal. In the, in the terminal. Okay, we are almost good to go. So now we have um, the, the directory in our temporary folder. We're just going to make it accessible through our user space, um, through a um, symbolic link. So run this last command, and then you should have access to the notebook. See, the folder has appeared here. And I have my notebook and my data. So. We are good to go now. OK, so in this notebook, we have prepared a case scenario um, in which we will use data from the Wikio data viewer to um, uh, study the impacts of wildfire on vegetation cover and ocean parameters. Um, so we here we're working with the Python environment mini wikio lab, uh, which is the um, default environment available when you uh, register uh, to a wikio. So we're studying wildfires because, um, well, it's an issue that we'll, we'll have to deal more and more frequently in the, in the coming decades. And um, wildfires have a lot of implications. They generate a high amount of CO2, their carbon dioxide. And we know that CO2 in the atmosphere drives the acidification of oceans. So in this notebook, we'll study, uh, we'll try to first try to spot a wildfire and see how it impacted the local vegetation. And then we'll try to assess the impacts it had on the uh, ocean parameters uh, in the local vicinity of the fire. So as I said, we are working with Python. Here's a little uh, summary of the Python libraries that we're going to use. Uh, we're going to use the NumPy library, which is uh, very commonly used. If you're already familiar with Python, you, you've probably already used NumPy. So it's great for working with uh, arrays and matrices. XArray has been already shown to you by Julia in the previous presentation. Uh, which is the library we, which we will use to open data sets and process them. We'll use Matplotlib and Cartopy for all, to draw the plots and the maps to visualize our results. Our results. And finally, we'll use Restereo because at some point we're going to deal with um, Sentinel-2 satellite images. So this is a very convenient library to uh, manipulate such data. And GeoPandas will be used to uh, deal with uh, a few um, geometrical um, data. So in this cell, I'm just going to import uh, all those required libraries. It's done. Now. And now we're going to use our first data set to spot a wildfire. So we, what we're going to do is we is that we are going to um, look at air quality products um, to monitor the emissions of carbon monoxide and particulate matter um, in order to uh, spot wildfires uh, in our area of interest. So we are using the produce European air quality forecast from the CAMS. Um, so it has um, data from uh, many different models, but we are going to use the model assemble to uh, monitor our, um, the carbon, di carbon monoxide. If you want to know more of the products, you can click on the link here, which will redirect you to the uh, Wikio data viewer, and you'll have uh, all, the inform all the additional information you need on the data. So it's already downloaded, we've stored it here. So here's a little uh, summary of how to, about how to retrieve the data. 
so Julia has uh, made a great presentation about uh, data downloading. So I'll probably go faster on this uh, on this section. Um, but yes, uh, you just need to make sure that you have your uh, credentials stored in a text file in the root directory. Um, there is a method described on the Wikio website uh, to, to do this. And for the second convenience, we have uh, written this cell uh, to uh, write automatically this, uh, this file that you need to uh, download data from Wikio. So you just have to replace those two, uh, those two strings of codes uh, with your own credentials, so username and password. So obviously, I, you can't, uh, I can't write my own here. And now that you're ready to download data, um, as it was explained in the previous uh, presentation, you can either uh, download data directly from the uh, from the Wikio Data Viewer or uh, build your own um, API requests, which we have done here. Oh, it's a little bit long, but uh, that's what we use to uh, recover the air quality data. And finally, well, we're not uh, executing this cell because we have already downloaded data and it takes a lot of time to uh, download the, the data set, but uh, this is uh, the cell that you, that you would use to um, retrieve the air quality data. So in our case, we already have the data set downloaded. Uh, as I said, it's located here in our data folder. So now we're going to explore it a little bit. So as you can see, this is our XRA dataset with um, all the expected um, variables and attributes. So we have longitude, latitude, uh, level, time, and uh, our main variables, which we have chosen. So they are um, carbon monoxide concentration, particulate matter concentrations, uh, particulate matter with a diameter superior to 10 centimeters and a diameter superior to uh, um, 2.5 centimeters. So if you want more information about the variables, you can click on this icon, which will show you more precise attributes. So the long name of the variable, its units, uh, how it is sampled um, temporally. And if you want to see a sample of uh, the values, you can click on this icon, which will show you um, well, some some values of the data to see uh, what the data looks like looks like. So when I'm looking at this data set, I can see that there are there is some pre-processing to do, which I'm which I'm listing here. So first of all, the dates are exp are expressed as time deltas. So as you can see here, if I'm looking at the time values of the data. Um, I would prefer I would prefer to have like real dates instead of such values. So here, the values are the number of, of seconds after the first uh, date in the data, which we know we have chosen it to be the first of June two thousand twenty-two. Here, this is our start date. So. The process will be to convert this time, this um, those time deltas to actual dates, starting with first of June and then um, iterating first of June at midnight, first of June at one a.m., two a.m., etc., until I think it is uh, September. One second thing, I can see that the longitudes range um, from zero to three hundred and sixty degrees. And for more, for a sake of convenience, I want them to be to range from minus 180 to 180 degrees. And finally, the data set here has hourly data. And uh, for spotting wildfires, we don't need to have such precise um, such such a precise temporal resolution. Um, so, for the sake also of convenience, to have a, a lighter uh, data set to use. We're going to resample the data set to have daily values by averaging day by day. 
So those three steps are done in this cell. So let's do it. OK, so our new data set is now displayed here. Uh, we can see that uh, the longitudes are now uh, well centered around zero. Uh, our time values are now actual dates, so which is good for us. It's a lot more convenient. Um, so now we are good to go. And one other thing, we can see that now the dates are daily values. So everything has worked just fine. We can now move on to the next section. So now I'm going to show you some basic subsetting operations uh, with the data set. Um, so the most common thing that you will have to do with the data set is subset it um, with, um, with regards to time. So I've shown you already the time values that we have. So we have day-by-day -day values from 1st of June to the beginning of September. And uh, what we have, what we going to going to do now is to select specific dates, and you will do it using the cell method uh, on the XRI dataset. For example, here I know a specific date that I want uh, to look at here to twenty fifth of June, and you can see that uh, I only have one time value for June. But still, uh, all the uh, well spatial uh, resolution that I had before only at one day. So let's now say that you want to know, uh, you want to see what the dataset looks like at a date, but you're not sure if this date is exactly present in the dataset. Um, you can use the method nearest to um, select the nearest date in the dataset as the nearest to the date that you have selected. So for example, uh, here I want to uh, know what the dataset looks like near uh, the 25th of June at 6 a.m. So if I'm executing this, uh, this cell, it's going to yield uh, the, the, the dataset value uh, at, well, at midnight because it doesn't have a 6 a.m. value, but will still be on the 25th of June. Another method to select dates is to select a date from its index. So basically, using the iCell function, we're going to select the 10th date because um, it starts at zero uh, of the data set. And we indeed have the 10th of June selected. So it's all consistent with uh, what, we had, uh, what we had expected. And finally, if you want to select a range of dates, um, you can use um, the slice function. And then you enter you start, your start date, your end date, and it will select you, well, all the dates within this range. So if you have I've selected only the month of July, and I have my 31 date values. So this is actually very, very practical, very convenient. OK, so we have seen how to uh, download the data, how to subset it um, with, with uh, time values. So now we're going to draw our first map. Um, so first of all, I'm using uh, this cell to delimit an area of interest around Western Europe which uh, we, is the area that we're going to, uh, to study. And after that, I'm going to uh, draw a map at a specific date. Here, I've chosen the date, the 18th of July, 2022. With this line, I'm selecting the carbon monoxide concentration because I want to plot a map of the carbon monoxide concentration. I'm selecting the specific date that I have defined here. And all those lines are just for drawing the map. All 
Okay. So as you can see here, there is a clear uh, plume of carbon monoxide here, and this is a sign of a wildfire. So of course, I've chosen the date 18th of July, uh, knowing that uh, there was a fire happening in this region uh, beforehand. But here, it's quite clear that, that uh, this is not uh, normal. So it's actually a real fire that, had, that has happened this summer in the Gironde region in France. Um, so there is an entire forest that has uh, disappeared. And um, yes, this is visible with the carbon monoxide uh, concentration, but it will also be visible if we selected other variables like, uh, for example, the particulate matter concentration. I can try that uh, just now and it should yield the same results. So yes, it's a little bit, it's um, very similar to what we have seen with carbon monoxide. So this is consistent uh, with uh, what we expected. Okay, in this next session, we are going to focus on this particular forest and try to estimate how much vegetation has been lost um, by analyzing satellite images. So the data that we're going to, going to use is uh, Sentinel-2 data, Sentinel-2 images. So it's a multispectral ima imaging satellite mission that you may have already uh, encountered uh, in your work. So it carries an instrument that has uh, many, up to 13 spectral bands, and the, its spatial resolution range to 10 meters to uh, 60 meters, depending on the uh, wavelength of the spectral band that we that you, that you are using. Um, in this in this uh, section, we are going to use only 10 meter um, 10 meter resolution spectral bands, so blue, green, red, and near infrared. So if we name them by the band number, it's band number two, number three, number four, and number eight. Um, so the data is already is also already downloaded in uh, your data folder, in the S2 subfolder. And um, here we have downloaded one satellite images uh, in June before the fire and one satellite images in September after the fire. And we got going to compare the two. So here's a cell that was um, that would help you uh, download the data and unzip uh, the product uh, once you have downloaded it. So it's not necessary to execute it uh, right now because we already have the data ready. So here is uh, also a delimitation of our area of, area of interest which we're going to uh, visually visualize right now. So we're going to focus on this specific area, uh, which is the forest that underwent the fire um, in this summer, in this summer 22, 2022. So in this cell, we are going to open all the data sets that we are going to need in this section. So with Sentinel-2 images, um, if you are not familiar with the, how the, the Sentinel-2 products are structured, I will just show you a, a brief summary of where the, where the data of interest is located. So here I've opened one of the images. This is the images from June. Um, the date is uh, written here in the product name. And the, date, the images are located in the granule subfolder and image data, resolution 10 meters. And here we have one file uh, per spectral band. As I said before, we are going to use B number two, three, four, and eight. So which is blue, green, red, and near infrared. So here are all the data paths to each of the bands. So those are the data paths for June and here for September. And with Rastereo, I will, I'm opening all of them and uh, storing them in a variable. Um, and of course, before end, I'm cropping, clipping all those images to this square here, which makes the variable, 
use a much much less uh, memory space uh, in the Jupyter Lab environment. So there's a lot of data to process, so it might take a few seconds. Oh no, it went. It was short. Okay. So now that we have stored um, all the spectral bands in variables, we're going to um, plot them to, to have a first visualizes, visualization of the forest before and after the fire. So with those two lines, I'm just stacking the red, green, and blue uh, channels to have a, a real color images image. And here are our two uh, images uh, in a red, green, blue uh, display. We can already visually see that uh, a lot of the forest uh, has disappeared. Um, and we're going to um, try to do a better characterization of this. So we're going to do this by calculating what is called the NDVI. Uh, some of you have, are probably already familiar with uh, this index. So it's basically the difference between between the near infrared, the normalized difference between the near infrared and the red band. Um, so here is a. Um, this image is uh, a summary of all the bands uh, available with uh, Sentinel-2. So as a reminder, we're using the red band here and the near infrared band here, band four and band eight. And those two bands are used to calculate NDVI, which is an index uh, that's very commonly used, especially in uh, agricultural science to um, assess vegeta vegetation cover. So we calculate calculating in for our two dates, June and September. Um, so that's what, that's what we do in this cell. And if we plot them, let's see what uh, we end up with. So it's already um, visually more obvious that there is a clear difference between the vegetation index uh, of June and the vegetation index of September uh, on the forest. Uh, it is much lower, um, much lower uh, in, uh, in September, uh, which accounts for the fact that the forest has disappeared. Now. And uh, what we're going to do now is to subtract the two maps and threshold this subtraction to um, show only the pixels of uh, disappear forest. So this is uh, our result. So we can see that there are some uh, unwanted uh, pixels here uh, that, have, that are not vegetation, but, have, who, but that have uh, still been uh, computed uh, in our uh, thresholding so yeah we have some unwanted uh, yellow pixels but uh, we clearly see um, well the regions where the forest um, has disappeared or where the vegetation cover has decreased if we want to uh, speak in more uh, general terms so uh, now that we have this uh, map we can give a very rough estimation of um, the surface of vegetation that has burnt in the fire. Because as we know, uh, we have used bands that have, that have a 10 meter resolution. So each pixel is approximately uh, as a, an approximate dimension of 10 by 10 meters. So by counting the pixels, we are able to evaluate uh, the surface of burnt forests. Here we find approximately 50 square kilometers. But once again, um, this is a very rough estimation. As I said before, there are unwanted pixels uh, in the sea, unwanted pixels in areas that we are not really studying, like the nearby towns here, for example. So by cropping the map to uh, an even shorter um, area of interest, we should be able to give a more precise estimation. But this is, of course, a, a first step. 
So in the next section, I'm going to um, try to evaluate the impacts um, on the CO2 in uh, the Bay of Biscay, uh, which is the, the bay where the forest is located. So we are going to see if the CO2 emissions uh, from those fires have had a significant impact on the ocean parameters uh, of the local, uh, local sea. So we're going to use another data set, uh, which comes from the Copernicus Marine Service. Um, so it's the Atlantic Iberian Biscay Irish Ocean Biochemistry um, Reanalysis and Forecasts and Hindcasts. Um, we are using two data sets here because um, those two data sets that I'm describing here uh, come from uh, approximately the same model but one only covers the in area, um, the temporal range from 1983 to 2020 and the other from 2019 to uh, now. And what I want to do in this section is to compare, um, well, the, the variable values of summer 2022 with the previous years. So I need a lot of years of data. So for the sake of this training, I'm uh, concatenating those two models, but of course, um, in a real uh, research context, you will have to be more cautious when uh, using uh, two different data sets to uh, study a similar phenomenon. So let's see the impact on the CO2 partial pressure on the um, seawater surface. Oh, sorry, as I've mentioned before, uh, I, I haven't mentioned, but um, we, these two data sets we are going to use uh, to look at the variables partial pressure of CO2 on seawater and pH, because in the end what we want to evaluate is ocean acidification. So this is the area that we're going to focus on. So as you remember, the fire was in this region and we're going to focus on the parameters uh, here on the uh, Bay of Biscay. As we remember, the, the carbon monoxide plume covered a la large area, so this is a reasonable uh, area to, to study here. Let's open our data. So now you are used to uh, inspecting uh, data sets with uh, XRA, so here we see that we indeed have uh, dates, so we don't have to do pre-processing uh, in this case. And our longitude are centered around zero, so uh, everything is fine. Okay, so now in this, um, in this section, we are going to, um, well, compute the mean over July and August, which is uh, the time period where the fire happened from uh, the 12th of July to um, the 21st of August, if I'm correct. So we're going to um, temp temporarily average uh, all our data sets over June and uh, July and August and resample it by year. Oh, something went wrong, sorry. I'm reopening everything. Okay. And now we're going to perform the spatial average over the Bay of Biscay uh, to have the spatial uh, mean of the partial pressure of CO2 on seawater. And in this plot, we're going to compare year by year um, the mean value of the partial pressure of CO2 over the Bay of Biscay uh, during July and August. And this is what we end up with. So we are not drawing any conclusion from this, of course, but I'm going to move on to the next session and see what happens with pH. So it's going to go a little bit faster because uh, the process, we are using the same data set, only a different variable. So the process is going to be exactly the same. And there we go. So as we can see on the area we selected, uh, it seems that 2022 is um, the area, is the, the year where, um, in, where in July and August, 
the seawater in the Bay of Biscay has been the most acid and uh, where the partial pressure of CO2 has been the highest. But of course, um, it is not possible to conclude then, thanks to these um, results alone. Um, first of all, we can see that there is a clear uh, trend component uh, in the data. So to have a more exact uh, result, you will need to uh, compensate for this trend. And of course, we've only studied two different parameters, but uh, we, can, we know that in, in ocean science, uh, everything has often uh, multiple factors. Uh, for example, a factor that could drive the partial pressure of CO2 uh, and pH in the water is obviously temperature. And we know that 2022 has been quite uh, an exceptional summer uh, in terms of temperature. So this study should be a lot, depend a lot more to uh, really conclude if uh, the fires uh, are responsible for um, a surge in acidity um, in the Bay of Biscay during 2022. However, literature has shown that in other cases, um, well, wildfires have had uh, biochemical impacts uh, on, on water, whether it was seawater or, or lakes, for example. Um, but um, for what it, most, it mainly happens through the transportation of uh, materials like uh, sediments, um, fire ashes, uh, which change uh, the chemical properties uh, of the water locally. So we haven't been able to clearly observe that uh, in this particular case, but uh, this study can always uh, be deepened. And uh, yes, another another analysis that should be made is uh, doing performing the same analysis on an area that hasn't been affected by um, a not noticeable wildfire in uh, 2022. So we are approaching the conclusion of uh, this presentation. Uh, so if we want to, if we do a brief summary of what we've seen, so we have seen how to spot a wildfire uh, thanks to uh, air quality data uh, with carbon monoxide and particulate matter emissions. Um, we characterize the vegetation loss by analyzing satellite images. And finally, uh, we try to assess the impact of the fires on the ocean parameters. Well, without finding uh, significant results in the particular case, but uh, it was still an interesting uh, analysis to make. Um, so if you um, execute this um, this notebook at home, there are some exercises that, we, that you can always uh, try to do. Um, so this one I've already done. So pl I've plotted the carbon monoxide emission, but I'll show you how to plot the uh, particulate matter emission. So. You can always do that again uh, at home. Uh, you can try to plot maps at other dates. Um, yes, I've mentioned that um, our estimation of the burn surface was very rough. So you can try to implement methods to uh, give a, well, a more precise estimation. So one lead that I give you is to narrow the area of interest, for example. Um, and finally, you can make uh, another use of the Sentinel-2 uh, images. Uh, for example, we know that uh, summer 2022 has been uh, also exceptional in terms of the droughts. So here I'm giving you another uh, indicator uh, which will help you monitor drought, drought, droughts uh, if you want. So you can also try this. And finally, so we have focused on analysis in the 2022 fires uh, in the Gironde region. You can also always reproduce such analysis on another region um, if uh, you feel like uh, you are up to the task. So I'm closing my presentation. I can I thank you for your attention and I will be happy to take uh, any questions uh, if you have some. Thank you very much, Alexon. It, uh, it was a nice presentation. Well done. Uh, we do have some questions indeed. Um, uh, the first question, maybe Andrea, you'll answer them. It's about where can we find the notebooks uh, on what links, etc. So maybe Andrea, you can answer this. Sure. Um, so the notebooks are on the Wikio Drive. 
Um, and on the chat, we have posted the, um, the command line that you can uh, type on your Jupyter uh, space, work, uh, workspace, and that you will help you retrieve the notebooks directly. Um, in the future, the idea is to put them available on the Jupyter lab so that you can see them on the public um, folder uh, as uh, it should be. Uh, but uh, for the moment and for this exercise in particular, um, they are on the wiki drive and this is the way to access them. I hope okay. it was clear. Um, we can share maybe um, the link, but I think uh, the command line. I don't seem to find it <laughs> anymore, but um, I will make it uh, visible again on the chat if you want. Okay, great. Thank you. Another question, how well protected are the netbooks in my workspace? Uh, hard coding username and password is not a good idea regardless. It would be helpful if you could modify the netbooks with authentication and uh, to dynamically ask about use credentials through a dialogue input box. Alexandre, maybe can you answer this? Maybe Jean Etienne? Well, yeah, that's probably the case. Uh, yeah, it was a rather simple method that we implemented, but uh, yes, we can implement a more a safer uh, authentication process, I guess. Thank you. Um, another question why is the NDVI? Uh, completely white uh, where there is water on, in June but black in September. Sorry, I was muted. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I think uh, it's a matter of um, I'm not exactly sure. I don't exactly know the, the answer to that. Uh, I think it's a matter of uh, scale in the data visual visualization. Um, as water has very significantly different properties uh, in terms of spectral reflectance as vegetation. Um, I think when you calculate NDVI on, on water, it can go very, uh, have a very high, very low value depending on the image. So I think it's a. Uh, that's a random thing. Okay. Well, thank you for this answer. Another question. What techniques are there to get more precise estimation except cropping images? Um, so cropping images is one thing, but uh, you can also play on the um, threshold that you use on the NDVI subtract subtraction. Uh, here, the one I used was arbitrary, but uh, you can always uh, implement um, a final method of uh, thresholding to uh, have something more uh, more consistent and um, more relevant. So this is another lead that you can that you can try to explore to um, have better results on this. Oops. Uh, thank you. Uh, can the area of interest only be rectangular? So it depends on uh, what uh, section you are referring to. Uh, if you are referring to the satellite image parts, um, so I've used the, the raster library. And um, in this, in this uh, library, it's possible to uh, use um, a shape file to um, crop the map. So it's not so it's kind of, it's not necessary to have a rectangular one. I've used a rectangular one for the sake of convenience and uh, easier visualization. But um, with Rasterio, you can use shape files to um, crop your data. Thank you. And one last question. I think is it possible to have an explanatory module for the use of the program? Maybe this one's for Andre. I'm not sure. Um. Is it? Do you mean the Jupiter, the Jupiter Hub, or I, I think right? Yeah. Um, um, we can think about it, Alberto. If um, yeah, it's definitely a, um, a fashionable requirement nowadays, right? Uh, so maybe it could be interesting uh, to do that, or maybe like a short clip or something. But thank you for the suggestion. <laughs> and so I think that's the end of the. Mm -hmm. Session. Thank you very much, Alexandre, for your presentation and your answers. Thank you very much.
we can now move yes, on. Thank you, Alex. Yes, we can. And now we will have uh, Daria, who's going to do a short uh, demonstration on uh, how to use uh, Wikio uh, data in GIS, in QGIS. Um, Daria, yeah, she's coming in now. Great. Hello, Daria. Welcome. You Do you hear me? Yes, sounding clear. <laughs> Um, um, just can... for info, Daria is um, also a uh, QGIS uh, expert at uh, novelties. And uh, yeah, go for it, <laughs> whenever you <Yeah>. want. <laughs> Thank you. I'll share my screen to make sure that it works. Okay, you see my screen? Okay, great. Okay, so yes, as I was said, my name is Daria and I work at novelties as a Oceanographic engineer, and today I'm here to show a short uh, demo on how to use uh, VKO products for um, uh, in uh, QG software. And yes, this is going to be a demo exercise. Uh, if you want to have a full step-by-step -step, uh, instructions, you can go to the Padlet. There's going to be a video, a full video. Um, with more precise instructions. And also there's going to be a PDF file, if I'm not mistaken, with also like very, very precise step-by-step um, -step, uh, um, explanation. So a short intro into what this exercise, this tutorial is about. So uh, for this tutorial, we chose um, the 2022 European heat wave. So as you might, you might know, uh, last summer, uh, summer 2022, uh, Europe being struck by a um, uh, very high uh, uh, an, an, uh, high heat anomaly, and um, at some places, like you, you can see on this picture, at some places the temperature was uh, reaching even 45 degrees Celsius. So of course, this uh, heat wave uh, uh, caused um, uh, economical uh, economical damage, and of course, uh, health related health related issues. Uh, among the population, and um, oh, this uh, this heat waves was uh, was caused by um, climate change, of course. So, uh, what we're gonna do? We're gonna move to the QGIS project itself. I hope uh, you see the you see the QGIS itself. So. Uh, here, I'm not going to say again step-by-step uh, -step, uh, instructions. So I will just show some results of uh, what's been done for two exercises. So in this tutorial, it's going to be two exercises. And um, I'll just start, I guess. So first exercise, oopsie doopsie. OK, so first exercise was about to um, how to analyze uh, uh, air temperature. So we have a product. So we have uh, two products downloaded from Copernicus Marine. Uh, oh, sorry, from VQO, VQO platform. Um, it's been uh, yes, it's air temperature here in Celsius, and also for a second exercise, it was relative air humidity. And um, to insert them into QGIS, we use a plugin called NetCDF to QGIS. Uh, here, this plugin was um, was developed by Novelty's team. Uh, here I'm not gonna I'm not gonna show you probably yeah I mean you can just click here you browse to your uh, to your um, directory then you have an CDF file and you just add it I can do it very very quickly pop pop it's not very important but for example I have um, some NetCDF file and here you can see uh, variables that are included in uh, this product. So I already mapped them. Here um, we can see different days of uh, air temperature uh, during uh, 2022 uh, summer, summer 2022. So here is from 1st of June till uh, 30th of August, each 10 days, just for um, quicker uh, uh, representation. And you can see the evolution of um, of uh, the temperature by unticking, unticking the layers. So this is our raster layers. You can see with this, uh, with these icons. Uh, here we can see, for example, for the exercises for future, uh, for, for next steps, we chose uh, one date. It was 20th of July, because here you can see um, 
uh, how um, how heat wave is uh, spreaded along the along the Europe, and you can see that several places are uh, extremely uh, extremely uh, in, like influenced by high temperature. Here you can see the bar to see the correspond, uh, corresponding of uh, colors to the temperature. And so the next step was to to find out the, um, the temperature, so the mini, minimal, maximal, and the mean temperature for countries, specific countries, during uh, uh, exactly this day, during the 20th of July. Of course, uh, you, when you're going to play with this uh, exercise, you can choose any other any other date, any other time frame. So to do so, we first exported a specific additional layer. This layer is being obtained uh, uh, via website. All the information is going to be also in PDF file. And here you can see that this layer is a line layer uh, representing the borders of countries for the whole world. We are not really interested in the whole world, but we will we will uh, subset our, um, our subset our our territory we're interested in. So these are just lines. Let me open processing toolbox. This uh, basically toolbox with all all the tools, all the functions and features you want to use in QGIS. So uh, what we first did is we converted these lines to the polygons. Uh, both lines and polygons are vector uh, vector layers, just for information. And here you can see that there are polygons again for a whole all the countries in the world. And uh, to do this, uh, you can uh, do it by polygonize function. Pop, 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 pop. Yes, this one in vector geometry. Yes, there are several uh, polygonize functions. They, you should be um, uh, careful what uh, what you're choosing but again like in the full video there are more precise uh, instructions so in uh, polygonize you can choose uh, basically only this uh, layer only the one line layer we have so after we did it we had these polygons and what we wanted to do next is to choose only several countries so uh, european countries um if you s if you look back at our raster layer you can see that it doesn't cover all uh, all European countries but so our goal was to choose just some of them that are more or less um, coherent with the layer and uh, it was this let me do that so the yellow are the countries that we we've chose uh, from uh, all our polygons and to choose polygons is actually quite easy you have uh, this tool where is it up select features you just click and choose uh, whatever. Okay, it's a bit slow, I guess. What? Sorry. Yes, like features by polygon, for example. And by polygon, if yeah, okay, features by radius and one by one. And after you can just um, save these features as. Uh, Export, export uh, selected features as as a new as a new uh, layer if it's not um, available because we did not select any feature. So like this, we have our new territory we're more interested in, and what we wanted to do is to see the different uh, the temperatures in uh, according to each country. So for this, there is a tool which is called Zonal Statistics. Yep. This one, here you can choose a um, uh, raster layer on which you want to have uh, information, so the data itself. We chose uh, 20 of July, for example, and input layer is a vector layer which basically gives you the, the mask on which you want to extract uh, the data, and it's uh, European countries. You can run and close. I already have it, so it creates basically, oopsie, so it, uh, let me un... Yes, unselected. So basically it creates the new layer exactly the same. The difference is if you right click and go to attribute table, now you have um, uh, you have uh, additional columns with uh, temperature values. Uh, here you have uh, minimal, maximal and mean according to like corresponding to the whole country. And if you don't know what is this 
country exactly because it's just some number. You just right click, flash feature, and oop, it shows you what is this place. What is this polygon exactly? So like this, we found out the different statistics about uh, extremities of a temperature for each country. And what we want to... Ah, what we wanted to do is also to show how to highlight a specific um, region on a map, which is, um, for example, for, for which air temperature is higher or lower than specific threshold. For this, what first we need to do is we need to take our uh, previous raster layer, this one, and we need to vectorize it. And this done is by raster conversion raster to vector with this function you can have this don't look at this fully uh, it's already filtered so if i remove filter i'll show you so after we vectorize basically we have raster layer converted to vector layer so you see the this um, layer uh, consists of a lot of, lot of polygons and each polygon has uh, some specific value in it. Uh, so this is the whole of uh, the, the whole uh, raster layer converted but we are interested only in specific place for example we want the region with uh, temperature um, equal or more than 37 degrees Celsius. So we put here in a filter I'll show you I click on OK Okay, it does not, oh, let me, okay, so right click, filter here, we put it, we can test, okay, so now we see a little uh, window shows that uh, it's only 119 rows are chosen among all others, so we click on okay, and here you can see these polygons, uh, so now it's only polygons that corresponds to value which is 37 degrees and higher. So here we can see it's in Spain, in Portugal, some in Italy, here. So um, every time when we use this function, polygonize function, so converting from raster to vector layer, we should remember to use um, fix geometries function. So we need to fix our new geometry. And you can see it here. Oh. Because uh, if we want to continue our spatial analysis with uh, vector uh, vector layer that was uh, created from raster layer, we need to fix uh, any any possible errors that can occur during this conversion. Because uh, well, you might you might skip this part. You might not fix geometries, but you will see later that, for example, when you do some uh, additional spatial analysis, you uh, try to find some distances between layers or whatever, you can see that uh, when you will run some functions, it will say tell you so to, but it cannot do it because there are some uh, inconsistencies uh, in the geometry. So please fix it first. So uh, even though you didn't do this step, uh, fixed geometries, uh, QGs will uh, tell you to, to fix it first before moving forward. So like this, we fix geometries and it basically creates the new layer, which is exactly the same. Uh, you won't even see the difference between them, but there is uh, for QGIS. And uh, what we want to do is also to, as we now filtered our um, region with um, region which is uh, covered, which, which has air temperature more than 37 degrees. Uh, we wanted to see how big is this area like in kilometers uh, square, square kilometers. So for this, we need first to dissolve our polygons because you can see here that it's not a one polygon. It's like a lot of small polygons in a, uh, in a big polygon. So we can dissolve it. We have this new layer, we've dissolved one. And again, everything is here. You can you can find uh, any, any function. And when it's dissolved, uh, you can uh, open attribute table. Here you can see area, but when you first dissolve, you don't have a, you don't have an area. What you what you need to do is to go to um, calculator. Yes, open field calculator, and here you can see uh, you can create new field, and you can put a formula. But it's, if you have a formula, here you can also see some um, um, additional uh, additional. Uh, 
hints on what to use, how to use. So you can play with it and also add some <coughs> additional uh, columns here. Here we just only calculated the uh, area. And that was all for the first exercise for the air temperature. And the second one, let me, yeah, I won't uncheck it so far. The second one was about relative humidity, relative air humidity, because uh, heat wave is, um, and the heat, uh, extreme heat conditions, they always characterized by two, by uh, two variables, by combination of these two variables. It's air temperature and relative air humidity. So I wanted to see also <clears throat> uh, some, um, uh, also, we want to see some uh, evolution of a relative air humidity variable. So, as we chose only one uh, one um, time frame here, only 20th of July, so we decided to download only one <clears throat> one uh, time frame for relative air humidity, and we chose the global one. So you can see uh, temperature for this day for the whole world, and we did this just to show you how also like to crop our um, area of interest uh, in, like in, in raster, um, raster wise. So what we want to do is uh, we already know from first exercise, we know these regions with um, very high temperature, uh, more than 37 uh, degrees. So we want to also find, um, we want to project our relative air humidity on this specific regions this one in uh, this pale uh, pale red so for this let's go back we have this layer and we can clip the area like this okay let me um yes like this and to do this you go to raster extraction clip raster by mask layer you choose uh, different layers clip it and now you have um, additional layer from the raster layer which is clipped uh, on specific uh, uh, specific place. So uh, also a very brief, um, um, how to say, a little brief task that you can also perform with QGIS is to create a plots, a scatter plots. Uh, here, for example, you have a, a whole, uh, sev like several plots you can you can do, vector layer, scatter plot, histogram, and so on. Uh, well. Honestly, these plots, these scatter plots, are not super nicely done, not super nicely tuned here in QGIS. It's much easier and more, um, uh, how to say, it's more interactive to tune them and uh, work with them in in Python, for example. But we wanted to show you that there is a possibility like this. Uh, if you need, by some um, at some point, to have a scatter plot here in QGIS, you can do it. So what we want to do is to see the scatter plot of um, uh, of uh, this on this region of these regions, we want to see uh, relative humidity, a scatter plot of relative humidity to latitude and longitude. So for this, we have raster layer, as we already know, but it's a raster, so it uh, consists of pixels. And uh, for scatter plot, you need to work with points. So first, what we do, we convert uh, our rasters to points. It's also easy to do. You just uh, put pixels and yes, raster pixels to points. So now every pixel is, uh, as you can see, is uh, replaced with um, uh, a point. And also what we want to do is basically another layer, points layer, but now it has its coordinates, its uh, latitude and longitude here. And to, to do this, to have this, um, uh, to have these values, you just need to, uh, I think it's add XY, yes, XY fields to layer. Here you, yeah, you choose the, um, you can only choose it for point layers. So you choose your point layer and voila, you have a latitude and longitude. So like this, now we have a, uh, each pixel is a point uh, with its value. Of course, uh, this point is not only just have latitude and longitude, of course, it also has a value of relative air humidity. And then you go to these plots um vector layer scatter plot 3d i want 3d here you choose the layer you choose different attributes uh, it's better to it's better to maybe do several plots to tune best the um, position of axis 
and then you run it you can uh, save it and i have it saved i'm more than sure yes oops so yeah here you can see the resulted scatter plot it's going to be uh, opened in your browser uh, you can also have a lot of um, not too much actually but uh, some um, some tools to to zoom to save uh, download plot as a png and so on here you can play with it a bit but yes that's like as you can see it's not very very representative so here for example this is a um, longitude in the y axis in the x axis it's our um relative air humidity in percentage so from 10 to 50 i think yep and then that it's latitude so you can see uh here and uh, correlated to what we saw in QGIS. And also, yes, you can, uh, each point, you can see the, it's, it's, it's uh, coordinates, latitude, longitude, and, um, and the value. So that's, that's it. Uh, I know it was very brief, but again, there's video, there's PDF, if you want to do it more step-by-step, step, if you didn't notice uh, some things. And yes, uh, with these exercises, uh, you basically, learn some uh, basic features of uh, QGIS uh, and how to map the products from Vecchio platform there. So, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tadia. Um, it was indeed a very short presentation, but it was, I think it was also very, very useful. Um, you showed a lot of uh, good features. Um, we have, I think we have uh, two questions at least for you. Um, I can stop sharing screen, right? Yes, you can, yeah. Okay. Oh, great. Right on time. Uh, so first one. With the polygons option, is it possible to use it to select agricultural parcels? Would you be aware I'm of not, this? I'm not sure what does it want mm. to say agricultural parcels exactly? Maybe something that you know that is uh, like a piece of land that is um, used as an agricultural parcel. and um, But I guess you can select it as a polygon, right? Uh, yes, if it means like some specific part of the land, uh, like used for uh, this or that type of agricultural activity. Uh, first of all, yes, here I used polygons of um, countries uh, with country borders. And to have this information, you can just go and search in the internet for uh, different polygons. There are a lot of, lot, lot of sites with different information, with polygons on sea, on the land. It might be also the some agricultural um, polygons and if they are presented in a shape file that's the, the best uh, that you can find because it's very easily uh, imported to QGIS and it's very easy uh, to work with it so um, yes and uh, if you already and when you if you have like several polygons a lot of polygons on your uh, on your QGIS project uh, there is a function, I showed it, but again, you can see it more precisely in, um, uh, in a full tutorial. It's called select features. So you can select features uh, specifically manually, basically, if you want some specific one, not all of them that you downloaded, for example. I hope it mm -hmm. was that okay. what was asked. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yes, like you said, um, you can also um, uh, check the full uh, details on our tutorial that will be in the Padlet. Uh, there's another one. Uh, what was the name of the plugin that was mentioned in the beginning? You mentioned the... Yes, yeah. the name is netcdf to gis I can write it in comments or we write it yeah. uh, later. Sure. So yeah, this is a plugin that's been developed specifically to um, easily import NetCDF files to uh, QGIS because in uh, Vecchio platform and in other platforms, there are very often data is presented in uh, NetCDF uh, format, which is very good format in uh, for handling uh, data with um, a complex nesting of different variables. So uh, yes, this um, because before in QGIS, that was a bit of a problem to intro, to import these uh, NetCDF files. So now it is easier. And if you want this plugin, it's going to be in Padlet, maybe. I don't know. But we definitely yeah, have we some, 
Yeah, we definitely have some uh, information on the website about this plugin, about how it works, how to download it, how to how to how, how to load it, it connected to your QGIS. We also can leave links for this, I guess. Yes, yeah, definitely. We will make it available. Um, and I think that is all the questions for you, Zadia. Good. I think it was uh, very clear. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, thank you all for participating. Uh, it was a very nice session. Um, I hope it was not too uh, difficult to follow. Um, if you're a beginner, maybe a little bit. But uh, if you're a more advanced user, um, maybe it was fine. And anyway, you will have all the materials. Um, if you see on the top part, you will see with your university's dedicated material. You will have a direct link to, but to the Padlet, where all the information and exercises will be available as well. And um, I think uh, this is it for today, right, Ergen? I think it's the end. I think so as well. Thank you very much to everyone who attended and to everyone who presented. We've had very great, well, amazing presentations today. And um, well, yeah, that's it. <laughs> we that's have it. the briefing session. The exactly. Keys, yes. It's um, going to be on the yeah. yes, 10 a.m. again. Um, so, yeah. Exactly. So yeah, you can. We will have the speakers of yesterday's session, and also uh, Daria and Alex, and uh, maybe Julia were um, there, and you can ask some more of your questions. Um, and until then, you can try to um, maybe practice and try to redo these exercises we have showed you today. Um, thank you very much, and uh, I see you then. I hope. <laughs> see you. Bye. Bye-bye. Have a good day. <laughs>